believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. We believe. We believe. I believe. Good morning. There we go. Guess I turned it off. Hey, welcome to week seven of Believe. If you're just checking us out for the first time, welcome. Uh, thanks for taking a chance on us this morning. If this is your second time, thanks for coming back. If You've been here all along. Great. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, we're in week seven of Believe, and we're taking a 30-week journey through the top beliefs, practices, and virtues of the Christian faith as we're learning to think, act, and be more like Jesus. And if you're just joining us and just getting into this or you missed any of the weeks, you can always go to our website, epiphanystation.com, and you can access any of the previous messages from this series or going back uh, through the years uh, to check those out. Just click on the media tab and that will take you right to it. We're in week seven today and the topic is humanity. And I don't know about you guys, but um, probably a lot more often than I would like, I am constantly reminded of my own humanity and my own humanness. A couple weeks ago, our family was on vacation. It was actually kind of a staycation. We were just kind of staying home, trying to get things done around the house, get unpacked from our recent move. And I don't like going to church when I'm on vacation, especially not this church. I mean, I, I love you guys, and I love our church, but I just can't come and just worship without working. And so I've just learned to just kind of stay away. But my kids don't really understand that. The problem is they love this church. I know it's a big problem to have, but, but they love this church. And so they kept asking, are we going to go to church? Are we going to go to church? I'm like, no, no, no. We're not. I'm, Daddy's on vacation. We're not going to church. They're like, come on. And they're, they're really bummed about it, which is cool, I guess. But I kind of made a deal with them. I had this idea. I'm like, okay, kids, we got this new 55-inch TV and we got surround sound now. Wouldn't it be cool if we watched the live stream on the big screen with the surround sound? And they're like, oh yeah, that would be kind of cool, I guess. And, and so I started creating this perfect picture in my mind of what that would look like with my well-behaved children all snuggling with me on the couch uh, as we're singing in perfect pitch and harmony together these songs. And it was a really beautiful, beautiful picture. And I knew that one thing had the potential to kind of shatter this picture, and it was the fact that I'm not really good with technology. So that's okay, because Saturday night, I made sure, I did a run-through to make sure that everything was working properly, and it just went remarkably smooth. And I told Heidi, I was like, wow, that was really easy. Everything's all set up for tomorrow, and it's working great. So Sunday morning, I got up. I went to Hugo's to get some donuts to surprise the kids since we wouldn't be here to indulge in treats. And so I came home with the donuts, and for a moment I was their hero. And uh, I made the coffee, and we doled out the donuts, and we all settled into the couch to begin worship. To begin worship. To begin worship now. And all I get is this message that says, media player not compatible with this device. And I'm like, what do you mean? I went through this all last night, and it worked perfectly. Of course it's compatible with this device. So I thought, well, I must have done something wrong, so I just kept retrying, retrying, retrying. Nothing would work, and I was getting frustrated. But that's okay, because I know me and technology don't get along, so I had a plan B. So my plan B which I had already tried that as well, was to play it on my phone and send it from my phone to the big screen, which I've done before, and it works great. It's really cool. And so all I have to do is pull up the service on my phone, and hey, there it is on my phone. It's great. And then I just have to send it to the TV. Send it to the TV. <laughs> Come on, send it to the TV already. Nothing. Playing on my phone, but it won't go to the big screen. 
At this point, we've missed like the first 20 minutes of the worship experience. Our kids are getting unruly. Our girls are running all over the house, screaming and yelling. The boys are wrestling on the floor like, like boys do. And I'm like, okay, I can still, I can figure this out. We can watch the 11 o'clock live. And I can figure this out. I was like, okay, I got a plan C, my Kindle. I can play it on my Kindle and, and do that through the TV. So I'm trying to get that to work. And it's, it's worked before just like this. Like this. Just like this. Come on. You've got to be kidding me. Nothing would work. And as the tension is mounting, the kids are getting louder and louder and more unruly. And my wife Heidi is saying, well, did you try this? Yes. Well, how about this? Yes. Do you want my help? No. <laughs> and I was just getting really frustrated. And in this shining moment of my humanity, I swore, I know it's hard to believe, I threw down the remote and I stormed out of the room and slammed our bedroom door. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Perfect picture shattered. Here's Pastor Daddy on Sunday morning trying to gather his family for worship and I just swore in front of all of my kids got angry and left the room. Another humbling and humiliating reminder of my humanness. As we were getting in, starting to get into this belief series, and I was previewing all of the chapters and uh, just kind of getting ahead, trying to see what they were all about. And I came to this week's chapter on humanity, and I looked at that and I thought, well, that sounds boring. That sounds like a mandatory college credit you got to take this class in the humanities. Who wants to do that? What, what does that fit in to our core beliefs as Christians? But as I started digging into it this past week, I was quickly reminded of my own frail humanity. And I realized that this is actually one of the most important chapters in the whole series. Because we all have this one thing in common. We are all only human. I'm human, and you're human. And if I'm human and you're human, that means the person sitting next to you is also only human. And the person sitting behind you and in front of you is also only human. And that means that your annoying, brown-nosing co-worker is also only human. And it means that your meddling mother-in-law is also only human. And it means that that jerk who cut you off in traffic is also only human. And the politician that you're going to vote for or against on Tuesday is also only human. And that cold-hearted terrorist that you see pictures of on the news is also only human. We all have this one thing in common. We are only human human but there's a second far greater more significant thing that we also have in common it's that God loves every single one of us and every single one of them every single one of those people out there God loves every single one in fact Jesus would sum up how God views all of humanity with this one sentence that has become the most quoted sentence in the history of literature. In fact, it's so qu quoted that we can become inoculated with it, just, just losing its significance because we hear it so often that it loses its meaning. I'm sure, it, probably even if you aren't a Christian, maybe you've heard this before. Jesus says this is recorded by the Apostle John in his biography of Jesus. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have eternal life. And we've heard this sentence so much that it's just kind of disembodied. It just kind of floats out there somewhere in, in this abstract air. And we, we lose sight that, that Jesus said this in a conversation with a real human being named Nicodemus. A one-on-one -on -one conversation with Nicodemus who was a religious leader, a Pharisee. 
Pharisees were notorious for thinking they were better than other people. They were notorious for looking down their noses at people that, that weren't like them. They thought that, that God loved them more than other people because of their righteousness, because of the things that they did really to earn God's favor. And so they would look down their noses at other people from other cultures and other religions, and even people within their own culture and their own religion that weren't like them. Women, children, the poor, the sick, the disabled, really anyone and everyone who they thought didn't muster up to where they were in God's eyes. And Jesus, very early on in his ministry, debunks this myth that God somehow loves some people more than he loves other people. And he says, Nicodemus, let me tell you something. God loves the world so much. The world, Nicodemus, not just the pretty ones, not just the educated ones, not just the wealthy ones or the successful ones, not just those with charismatic personalities, not just the well-behaved children, but God loves every single one. Every single one. That means he loves the bartender as much as he loves the barista. He loves the Middle Easterner as much as he loves the Midwesterner. He loves the prostitute as much as he loves the preacher. The world means the world. The world and every single person in it. Every single person who has ever lived, ever died, or ever will live in the future is loved by God. In fact, loved by God so much that God sent his one and only son, not to condemn people, but to save them from the consequences of their broken humanity. Back in the very uh, beginning of Believe, I believe we launched on September 16th and 17th that weekend. And I talked about how every fruit has its root. And these first 10 weeks of Believe, we're really building up the foundation of the things that are going to inform our actions that we're going to be talking about beginning in January, which will in turn uh, lead to us hopefully having good character or virtues that we'll begin talking about at Easter time. And every, what we're doing is building a foundation so that the things that we come to believe during this time in our heads will hopefully lead to us doing good things and becoming better people. And the Bible, Jesus and the Apostle Paul talks about these virtues or good character that we'll be talking about beginning at Easter time as fruit. These are fruit that God produces in us. And every fruit has a root. Every fruit, every good character trait, every virtue has a root in a belief that we are talking about right now during these first 10 weeks. There can't be any good fruit without strong roots. So as we connect these dots between the beliefs that we're talking about now and the acts and the virtues, as we connect thinking like Jesus with acting like Jesus, with being like Jesus, we have to come to grips with this one simple truth that perhaps the reason why we are not more kind Perhaps the reason why we are not more gentle and more compassionate, perhaps the reason why we are not more generous with our time and our talents and our treasures, perhaps the reason why we don't really share Jesus with other people is because we don't see people the way God sees them. We don't see people the way God sees them, and therefore we don't treat people the way that God treats people. So this belief about humanity may sound like a boring, mandatory class that you might have to take at college, but it has huge implications and applications for our everyday life because we all live in a world that, guess what, is full of people. People that we ignore, people that we observe, people that we interact with on a daily basis. People that God loves. 
And if you want to become more kind, more caring, and more compassionate, if you want to be more selfless and more generous and more bold in sharing your faith with others, then it begins right here in this root belief about humanity. Because you cannot simply produce virtue by willing it into being. Come on, I just want to be more loving. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You can't just try harder. It doesn't work that way. Every fruit has a root in a core belief. And being more gentle, being more kind, being more loving, being more generous, being more bold and sharing our faith all begins right here in this foundational belief that God loves every single person. Everyone. That's our key idea for this week and believe is that I believe that all people are loved by God and need Jesus as their Savior. I believe that all people are loved by God and need Jesus as their Savior. The question then is, is what difference does this make in my daily life? I want to talk about three things, three differences that this should make in our lives if we really believe this. The first thing is this, is that we see people how God sees them. We see people how God sees them. All people are created in the image of God. All people are therefore precious in God's sight. And there's lots of things that I could talk about to, to illustrate this. But I want to show you an interaction that Jesus had with, with some people. As recorded by Matthew in his Gospel of Jesus, chapter 18. It was about that time the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? See, they wanted to know, Jesus, what's the rating system here with God? Who does God really love more than other people? And Jesus calls a little child to him and he puts the child, he put the child among them and he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and you become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. Now, as we read this, you know, there's lots of commentary and discussion about what Jesus means about becoming like a little child. But one thing that definitely gets lost on us, because in our society, we highly value children. We value children really above everybody else. Children are awesome in our eyes. But that wasn't at all the case in Jesus' day. Children were not valued in Jesus' time and culture as they are in our time and culture. Children were seen as a nuisance. At best, they should be seen, but definitely not heard. They were, couldn't contribute to society. They weren't pro productive members of society or of the family. So they were really disregarded and devalued until they got to the point where they could contribute something to the family and to society as a whole. And so Jesus takes one of these least valued members of society, puts a child on his lap and says, this is one of the greatest right here. The least is one of the greatest. And then he goes on to say this in verse 10. But beware, beware that you don't look down your noses at any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the ninety-nine others on the hills and go out to search for that one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, it's not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. The simple message Jesus is getting at is everyone matters to God. The one matters as much as the 99. Everyone matters to God. Furthermore, every stage of life matters to God. From the womb to the tomb, everybody matters to God. The senior struggling with Alzheimer's in the nursing home is of no less value than the CEO in Silicon Valley. And that person has no more value than the fetus in the womb. Everyone matters to God at every single stage of life. 
That means for us that there can't be any more placing value on people based on their physical appearance, based on their net worth, based on their productivity or the other things that we'd like to rate people by. Because God doesn't love me and he doesn't love you any more or any less than he loves anybody else in the world. Everyone, everywhere, at every stage of life matters to God. Here's the second difference it should make in our lives is that we treat people how God treats them. We treat people how God treats them. The day after my, my glowing display of humanity in front of my children, I happened to read this from Psalm 103, which is one of my favorite psalms, and it really hit me hard, though, as I read it. Part of it says, beginning in verse 8, that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. He is slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. And then skipping ahead a few verses to verse 13. It says, The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. As I read that, I thought, no, if not for anything else, that's the kind of father I want to be. Not the swearing, yelling, remote-throwing kind. I want to be the father who is gentle and compassionate and slow to get angry with his children. So that's what I've been praying since then, is that God would do that in me as a father first. But listen to why God does not treat us as we deserve. Verse 14 says, For he knows how weak we are. He remembers they're only dust. We're only dust. In other words, God doesn't treat us as we deserve because he understands that we are only human. We are only human. And you know what? That jerk who honks his horn and flips you off because you don't move the moment the light turns green, he's also only human. And if we could let this belief about humanity move from our our minds into our hearts and saturate us, then it might generate a different response than the response that we want to give to that person. We want to give back to them what they gave to us because they deserve it, right? Right? But if we let this belief about humanity sink into us, it could generate an entirely different response. Cause us to pause and to think, you know what? I wonder what kind of day that person is having to cause them to be so angry. Maybe they're having a bad week or a bad life. And even though they deserve it, I'm not going to give back to them what, what they deserve because that's not how God sees them and treats them. And I'm not going to see them and treat them that way either. And can you imagine the difference it would make right here in our church if we just simply treated people, treated each other the way that God treats us? Can you imagine the difference it would make in our community? if we just treated people the way that God treats people? Can you imagine the difference that we could make in your family, in our church, in our community, in the world, just by aligning ourselves with this one simple belief that God loves everyone? And I'm going to see people and treat people the way that God sees people and treats people. But there's, one, there's a third difference that it should make in our lives. And it's that we need to tell all people about Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. Remember our ancestors, Adam and Eve, back at the beginning of of creation, and we've been talking a lot about, been going to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and and 3 and looking at the, the character of God and the character of humanity to really establish some of these foundational beliefs. 
And the story of Adam and Eve is the story of humanity. In fact, the name Adam literally means humankind. And so his story is our story. And his story, as we looked at a few weeks ago, is a story of putting himself and trusting himself over trusting God. And the consequence, the result of that, was brokenness. A broken relationship between God and people and a broken relationship between people and other people. Both inward brokenness and outward brokenness. And that's our story. The story of humanity is brokenness. And if I'm broken and you're broken and all the people around us are broken, wouldn't we want to tell people that there is hope and healing for our brokenness in Jesus Christ? Why wouldn't we want to share that with people, that there is a remedy for our brokenness. There is a solution for our brokenness. This is why Epiphany Station is so passionate about seeing people come into relationship with Jesus Christ. This is why we are passionately pursuing a vision that God has given us of embracing thousands of outsiders in an authentic community of faith where they can be turned inside out by the life-transforming hope of Jesus Christ. This is why we are praying every Tuesday morning for 150 people by name to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we believe that telling somebody about Jesus and sharing Jesus with somebody is the most loving thing you could possibly do. If you know somebody's sick and you've got the cure, why would you withhold that from them? God loves the world so much. And this love of God changes the story of humanity. Beginning with you. If you can begin to see yourself the way that God sees you, then you can begin to see other people the way that God sees them. And if you can understand that God doesn't treat you as you deserve, then you can begin to not treat other people with what they deserve. Whew. I don't know about you guys, but this is some hard stuff. For me, this has easily been the hardest thing to believe as we've gone through these beliefs so far in this series. Because quite frankly, it's easier to believe in God than it is to believe in people. And I might know this to be true, and I might know that I should believe it, but I can't say that I truly believe it. The only thing that's really keeping me from believing it is me. It's my own humanity. What about you? What do you believe about humanity? What are you going to do to see people the way that God sees people? What are you going to do to treat people the way that God treats people? Here's where it gets really personal and uncomfortable. We all have people in our circles that we struggle with. People that we struggle to value, people that we struggle to like and to love. And right now I want you to think of one person in your life. One person that you struggle to value, that you look down your nose at, you publicly or privately mock or criticize because they're not like you. They're too pretty or too ugly or too fat or too thin or too rich or too poor or too annoying or too smart or whatever it might be. And I want you to bring it down to this very real and personal level, not some group out there like Republicans or Democrats or, or something like that. You've got to make it personal. Somebody that is in your personal network of relationships that you 
disapprove of, or you're disappointed in, or you disdain. Could be a coworker, or a family member, or a neighbor. Whoever it is, I want you to get that person in your mind. And whoever it is and however you view them, you need to understand that God sees them differently. God sees them differently and he treats them differently. Therefore, you must too. Here's the challenge. Here's what I want you to do. Because, because we're only human, we need a supernatural influence on us to change our understanding. So changing ourselves and our view of humanity begins with us asking God to help us to see people the way that he sees them, to change our perspective and to change our heart to be more like God's. That's the first thing, to pray that prayer and say, God, help me to see people. Help me to see this person the way that you see them. Change my heart. And then secondly, ask God to give you the humility to treat this person the way that God treats this person. God, give me the humility to treat this person the way that you treat this person. And then third, you got to take it now a step further. This week, make one kind act or gesture towards this person that will show them their true worth. One kind act or gesture towards this person that will show them their true worth. This belief about humanity drives so many of the practices and the virtues that we are going to be talking about in the coming weeks. And if we can change our belief about humanity, we can change our community. We can change the world, and you will be changed as a result by having your perspective and your heart changed to align with God's. In just a moment here as we close, we're going to have the opportunity to participate in communion together. And communion is, the communion table is the great equalizer. Everybody is welcome at Christ's table. All we have to do is admit our brokenness. Admit that we are broken and receive the forgiveness that is offered to us through Jesus Christ. But I believe this morning that God's calling us to do one other thing. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Today, as you come to this table, I believe that God is calling you, calling us, not just to confess your own brokenness and to receive Christ's forgiveness, but also to bring that person that you have in your mind to the table with you and to see their brokenness and to treat them as God treats you and has forgiven you, so you must Forgive them. That's what's laid before you this morning at this table. Here at Epiphany Station, we, it's how we, how we do it. As Ben's going to come up and lead us in another song as we close. And then you are welcome to come up any time during that point to form two lines and there's two baskets of bread and little cups of juice. You can take one of each and go back up the size to your seat. And then you can take that whenever you are ready, to take the, the bread that represents God's, Christ's body that was broken for your brokenness and take the cup that symbolizes the forgiveness that is found in the blood of Jesus for our brokenness. And if you've never taken that, that step where you've admitted your own brokenness and received the forgiveness that is offered to you through Jesus Christ, 
then before you can forgive anybody else, you have to first receive that forgiveness for yourself in Jesus Christ. So I urge you to take that step so that you will not perish in your brokenness, but have everlasting life beginning today. Let me pray. God, I ask that you would give us your eyes and your heart to see people and to treat people as you see people and treat them. God, this is a hard truth and a hard message. There's no doubt about it. So God, I ask that you would um, just enter in supernaturally, God, to change us from the inside out so that our community can be changed through your love for everyone. Thank you for the sacrifice that was given for us, that you loved us so much that you did not want to let us perish in our brokenness, but you sent a remedy in Jesus Christ. And right now we celebrate that. Thank you.